Hello, you're watching People's Dispatch and today we'll be talking about the political, social and economic crisis in Sri Lanka right now. Now, we're joined by Ahilan Kadirgamar, a senior lecturer at the University of Jaffna. We last talked to Ahilan in April at that point of time. There were already massive shortages, protests were breaking out, but a lot has happened since then. In May, the very powerful Prime Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa was forced to resign. A new Prime Minister, who is also a former Prime Minister, Ranil Vikramasinghe, has come to power. There's been a lot of political churning. So in this first section of the interview, we are going to be talking about the political situation, what the President and the government are trying to do, what is the kind of opposition that's emerging. Uh, so Ailan, thank you so much for joining us. So one of the first questions really is uh, about the political situation in Sri Lanka right now. Like I said, Mahinda Rajapaksa, a very powerful uh, figure in the history of Sri Lankan politics actually being forced to resign and uh, you know burst of p p uh, people's outrage uh, in fact I think believe houses were burned memorials were uh, targeted and there, it's been it seems like a massive rejection of the Rajapaksa legacy and then we have a new Prime Minister but again someone who's not really new Ranil Vikramasinghe has been around for the longest time so how do we uh, from the you know how do we do overall analyze the past two months in terms of the political configurations that are around right now since uh, April, as the protests had been mounting, the, the demand was for the entire Rajapaksa family to uh, go home. Uh, there were a number of uh, strikes which culminated in a general strike on May 6th, uh, Friday, May 6th, which uh, shut down the whole uh, country. And the president announced uh, that day that on uh, May 9th, the Prime Minister, his brother, Mahindra Rajapaksa, would resign. On Monday, May 9th morning, uh, the Prime Minister had many of his supporters, a couple thousand of them, at Temple Trees, the Prime Minister's residence, and had told them that he's thinking of uh, resigning. And uh, then the protesters left, uh, so, sorry, the supporters left uh, Temple Trees, and went and started to attack the peaceful protesters both outside Temple Trees and in Golface Green. Um, and the security forces and so on did not do anything about it. Uh, the tents of the protesters were burnt, uh, violence ensued. But then there was a backlash on that uh, day. Uh, a lot of people came to the defense of the protesters and beat back the supporters of uh, Mahinda Rajapaksa. And uh, not only that, that night, uh, a number of uh, Mahindra Rajapaksa's supporters in parliament, uh, MPs' houses were torched. And a lot of the, even the kind of symbolic house of the Rajapaksas and the memorial to their father was um, uh, vandalized and torched by very targeted uh, uh, measures of violence. And in fact, uh, protests were mounting very heavily outside the Prime Minister's residence where they had to evacuate the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister resigned as well. Now, this sent sort of a shock through the ruling class, right? They did not expect uh, this kind of uh, retribution and it showed the anger among the people. Uh, the Rajapaksas were visibly shaken. Everybody uh, had resigned except the president. Now, a few days later, um, while you know there was curfew for a couple of days, and President Gotabaya Rajapaksa appointed Prime Minister Ranil Vikramasinghe. Right now, Ranil Vikramasinghe had been Prime Minister five times before that. Um, you know, comes from the. Uh, the largest political party in the country, the United National Party, to whom the British had handed over power in uh, 1948. Um, you know, one of their leaders, uh, J.R. Jayawardena, took Sri Lanka in the neoliberal path when Ranul Vikramasinghe entered uh, parliament. Um, and it had been, you know, the symbolic of the ruling class for decades. But in the last parliamentary elections, that party was wiped out. In fact, Ranul Vikramasinghe also lost his seat and the, UN, the United National Party only gained one seat through proportional representation. And Ranul Vikramasinghe or nobody was appointed MP and only about a year ago, Ranul Vikramasinghe shamelessly came to parliament on that sole seat. Now he has been appointed prime minister. 
right? Partly, I think most people believe in Sri Lanka that even during the previous government, when the Rajapaksas were out, Ranul Vikramasinghe was prime minister and he saved the Rajapaksas. And so this is seen as a political deal between the Rajapaksas and Ranul Vikramasinghe to sort of save the uh, Rajapaksas. So that is one criticism of it. And two, uh, Ranul Vikramasinghe seems to have considerable international support from the diplomatic community who have been were very quick to support his appointment uh, as prime minister. And the message was sent that he is the credible negotiator for an IMF agreement or to gain support from the uh, international actors. And since his appointment and, and his promises of getting international support and so on, the protests have been somewhat subdued, but they are still continuing in golf phase. So now over the last uh, almost a month uh, since um, Ranil Vikramasinghe was appointed prime minister, he has not been able to deliver much. The same shortages are continuing in terms of fuel, in terms of cooking gas, uh, price hikes are uh, continuing. Um, there are negotiations going on uh, with the IMF, uh, but nothing substantially has changed on the ground. And in fact, they were to bring a 21st amendment to the constitution, greatly reducing the powers of the president and ensuring uh, independence in terms of governance and so on, independent institutions such as commissions and so on. But even a lot of that has been stalled because the reality in parliament is that uh, the Rajapaksa's SLPP still has a majority. So they are still calling the shots with uh, a semblance of stability brought about by the uh, subdued character of the protests over the last month. So we are kind of in this uh, stalemate now. And it's to be seen what's going to happen over the next couple of months, whether Ranul Vikramasinghe will be able to survive. He seems to be steadily losing credibility, the little credibility that he had when he was appointed. Um, would the IMF agreement go through? What would happen in parliament? So, so these are the questions uh, before uh, the country. Uh, now, uh, I must say a few days ago, uh, the Federation of University Teachers Associations, all our universities in Sri Lanka are state universities, and this is uh, their union. And I must also say I'm a vice president of uh, FUTA. Uh, we launched our proposals uh, for uh, political and economic stability, uh, in which we are continuing to call for the resignation of uh, President Gotabaya Rajapaksa. Uh, we feel that the appointment of uh, this uh, prime minister is undemocratic, uh, but we would like to see uh, interim government formed within parliament that would be uh, credible and acceptable, a, a national uh, government of sorts. And whether that kind of uh, process is possible. And uh, along with that, we are saying both in the immediate term and uh, going forward, there should be some kind of a people's council that right. works with parliament because the government has lost legitimacy, right? People are not uh, respecting the government, the parliamentarians, the president. So there has to be some way in which people's representation uh, is brought forward because we are in this contradiction. You know, we would want the path to be constitutional. At the same time, there's no political legitimacy for the parliament and uh, the president. So some kind of a compromise to bring about some stability because to immediately go for elections in this moment will also be difficult. One, we are in the midst of a severe economic crisis and uh, two, the people are not ready for elections. You know, we want people to have the space to think of their representatives and, and to put forward somebody who can actually give leadership. Otherwise, in a year's time, we might again be uh, uh, going into for another elections. Uh, right, Aina, in this context, just wanted to sort of, uh, you know, ask you further about two sets of oppositional spaces. So the first one is the official parliamentary and political opposition. We have the SJB, 
which is a major opposition party, the JVP as well, quite active. So what has been the position these parties have taken in this context? Have, have they been able to present, uh, you know, some kind of an alternative or a meaningful uh, uh, alternative to the people? And on the other hand, we've also seen that over the past few months, there's been this uh, flowering of democracy, as many people have called it. There have been a lot of small protests, a lot of debates, discussions. Uh, the main protest space, of course, in Colombo itself, as you mentioned, huge gatherings taking place like a public square. So what have also been some of the, uh, you know, what has been taking place in some of these spaces as well over the past few months? Yeah, if you take the uh, parliamentary space, um, parliamentarians, for the most, have, most part, have been discredited. Um, but, uh, you know, the opposition consists of course, of uh, the SJB, which broke away uh, from the UNP during the, the last elections led by Sajid Premadasa. Uh, there is the NPP, which is a coalition of the JVP with uh, three parliamentarians. And then there are other minority parties, uh, the TNA, the other Tamil parties, and the Sri Lanka Muslim uh, uh, Congress and uh, some of the Muslim parties. Now, one problem is that the opposition really has not taken advantage of the situation to put forward their vision of how to move forward. Um, if we take uh, the SJB, they really have not addressed the food crisis. Um, they, they are also uh, very much tied to this sort of neoliberal solution of going to the International Monetary Fund, an agreement, austerity. So they have not put forward an alternate view uh, of, of how they're going to address this uh, crisis from what, uh, you know, what is left of the government in terms of the central bank and the foreign secretary are putting uh, forward. So uh, there is a leadership vacuum in that sense. The, uh, the JVP and the NPP have been mobilizing quite a bit, but they have mainly been sticking to the issue of corruption. Mm -hmm. that the Rajapaksas have been corrupt, that various members of parliament are corrupt, and they are hoping to make their gains perhaps in the next elections, and they've been uh, pushing for uh, elections sooner rather than later. They're hoping to make some gains, but mainly on the uh, corruption issue. Um, but Sri Lanka is going through, you know, one of, you know, obviously the worst economic crisis since independence, and it looks, and it it's a time for, very drastic alternatives, which are not coming forth from the uh, parliamentary realm. Outside the parliament, it's, it's, it's very fragmented. Uh, the protests are being uh, taken forward. Uh, I must say that in the lead up to May 9th, uh, the trade unions played a critical role. They finally entered uh, the, the protest space. The, the general strike was um, uh, hugely successful. Um, but in terms of the politics outside, it, it's still very much fragmented. The Frontline Socialist Party, which broke away from the JVP about a decade ago, um, the, the student movement is with them. So they've been very militant in continuous protests and the students have been constantly tear gassed uh, by the police in, in these very militant uh, protests. But a coherence hasn't, isn't there in terms of what kind of a, alternative these protesters are asking for other than for the resignation of the uh, president. So uh, how these two political spaces are going to contribute towards putting forward a vision of an economy that uh, has to address this huge crisis and uh, increasingly people are also convinced that it's going to be a very long drawn out uh, crisis. Um, just six months ago, um, various policymakers, think tanks said, well, once you go to the IMF, three months, six months, we'll be uh, back to where we were, say, two, three years ago. But I think it's amply clear to everyone that this is going to be a long drawn out crisis. I'm seeing it as a crisis like in Greece, we're going to have a lost decade. Right. And if you remember in the 2010s, um, there was the revolving door of uh, parliamentary politics in Greece. They had seven uh, prime ministerial changes. So we might be also looking at something like that. We could go for elections soon, but then we might have to go for another election uh, again in another year or two. So 
so political stability is also linked to uh, the economic uh, questions and what comes of this very broad uh, protest movement, which I think will continue to come in waves um, because the underlying causes, both economically and politically, are still there to uh, propel this protest movement uh, onwards. Absolutely. Right. And before on to some of the economic questions, I'll end one question regarding the Rajapaksas themselves, because uh, we do know that over the past more than a decade, and especially uh, during the civil war to the kind of militant majoritarian politics they built, which, you know, there was a lot of human rights violations. But uh, over the years, even after the war, we saw a number of instances. And they built a very uh, powerful majoritarian support block, especially in the South. And today we see that a lot of this seems to have kind of fractured also. So has that politics basically sort of, uh, you know, run, uh, reached the end of its, uh, reached the end of its course, so to speak, or is there, you know, is there a possibility of revival? How does it look like? Yeah, the Rajapaksa regime itself has been thoroughly delegitimized. So I think it's going to very, be very hard for them uh, to come back to power in another elections, right? Uh, and by regime, I mean the family and their supporters. Um, people have completely lost uh, faith in them. But the ideology that they mobilized, Singhala Buddhist nationalism with the support of certain sections of the, the business class um, and the military, um, this mix, um, even though currently uh, it's on the path of descendants, at some other point, some other actor uh, may try to bring a mix of this and emerge on a nationalist platform. So that's my big worry. If you, if you look at Sri Lankan politics, we've never had a military coup. It has always been through this kind of nationalist mobilization. And there is the danger that currently there's a swing towards uh, the liberals, right? Away from this kind of authoritarian power, there's a process of democratization going on. And Rani Vikramasinghe representing the uh, liberals has been uh, appointed as a compromise. And, and even if Ranil Vikraswinger doesn't stay very long, let's say either with or without elections, the SJB or remnants of it, some kind of a liberal regime comes to power, they are probably not going to be able to address this economic crisis. They are not forthcoming with the kind of policies that could uh, add to it to solve this problem. And in that context, say in two, three years time, there can again be another swing to the right. And it could be against some kind of authoritarian populist or even a fascist who mobilizes you know, the, the failure of the liberals. And we've seen this uh, a number of times before. And uh, ironically, it's been under the, uh, under the stints of uh, Ranil Vikramasinghe as prime minister. In 2002, um, you know, after the, the war had been raging for almost two decades, uh, people were tired of the war. In 2001, the, the Tamil Tigers attacked the Katnaika airport and Sri Lanka for the first time went into negative growth. I think there was you know, minus 1% uh, GDP growth and we were in a severe crisis. There was Ranil Vikramasinghe was voted in as prime minister and there was a ceasefire agreement heavily internationalized. The Norwegians came backed by the United States, European Union and Japan as uh, co-chairs of a peace process. And Ranil Vikramasinghe tried to combine these peace negotiations with the Tigers with neoliberal reforms. There was the Oslo Donor Conference, the Washington Donor Conference, and finally in June 2003, there was a Tokyo Donor Conference where 4.5 billion US dollars were pledged, provided the peace process proceeds along with these neoliberal reforms. But Ronald Vikramasinghe had completely neglected the singular constituencies. And uh, within nine months, he was out of power. And that was the ascendance of Mahindra Rajapaksa, mm -hmm. first as prime minister and then as uh, president. Right. Similarly, in 2015, the Rajapaksas were thrown out. Uh, president Sirisena came to power. Uh, Ronald Vikramasinghe came as prime minister, a golden opportunity for Sri Lanka. Vikramasinghe decided to go with the Rajapaksas in order to ensure his 
power and to sort of uh, marginalize uh, Sirisena. There was, you know, in the next two years, 2016, 17, there was a drought in the country and disruption of uh, agriculture, paid no attention to it. And in 2018, January, we saw a massive comeback of the Rajapaksas. They even launched their own party, SLPP, and swept the local government elections, right? And, and that was, you know, that preceded their kind of regime change with presidential victory in 2019. Right. So we've seen Sri Lanka swing from the right to the liberals. And my worry is that again, there can be a swing like that. And when that happens, um, you know, it, it comes with a certain xenophobia. And now, particularly with all the kind of Western support for Ronald Vikramasinghe and the kind of IMF agreement, there's likely to be a backlash. And, but initially it can be kind of xenophobic against the West and possibly India, but then it turns inward against the minorities, divides them. So we've seen this scenario before, and of course you cannot predict history, but, um, and my worry is that we might end up with something like that, unless we use this moment, this huge political opening towards the process of democratization, you know, while building into ethnic relations. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Aylan. And that's all we have in the first segment of this interview. In the next part, we'll be looking at some of the details of the economic crisis that continues to hit Sri Lanka. Stay tuned.